Hey guys, this is Mr. Gonzalez with our ecology test review tutoring, our test next week. Uh, we'll cover all the ecology notes that we have. Uh, just know it's going to be a little long if you want to sort of pause and come back to it, rewind, but go over with your notes everything we talk about here, okay? Uh, and all, another thing to say is uh, a lot of people think that the movie is, is like a guarantee to pass and do well on the test. This is only tutoring, okay? So you really have to read your textbook. You have to understand your notes. You have to think critically when you answer these questions on our test, okay? So a lot of people are, think that the movie is going to save them. It's not. This is just to help you, okay? So let's start. First, we said ecology is the, the study of how organisms interact with one another and their environment. And if we look at an ecosystem, we said that it starts at the biosphere, which are the parts of the earth that sustain life. And then we move into our climate um, specific biomes, which we'll talk about in a second. And then biomes are broken up into ecosystems. Ecosystems include all the organisms that live there and all the abiotic factors, the stuff that's not living, like temperature and rocks and landforms and water, stuff like that. Community, uh, that just includes all the species that live there, only the living things. Population are all the same type. Remember, intraspecific interactions are uh, populations and inter specific are community interactions and then the individual which in this case is a reindeer um, and just remember that all species sort of um, sit in a, t a particular niche and a niche is sort of its role in the ecosystem and also its place so um, either is it a producer is it a consumer is it top of the food chain but also niches uh, describe where in the habitat they they uh, um, hang out so, for example, in a tree, we said there are different niches, and niches are excellent because uh, different species can exist uh, within the same habitat because they are in different niches. So, like, some birds will be at the top of the tree, some will be uh, middle of tree, and some birds uh, like to hang out under trees, okay? What factors are the ones that determine what a biome, uh, what conditions um, a biome will be? And we said that temperature and precipitation are the two, and that equals your climate. And each climate determines what biome you're in. Now, there's tons of biomes, but I said that you just have to know the characteristics of these, okay? So I'll say them real quick and the characteristics you need to know. So the first one is the most famous tropical rainforest, uh, very warm, very moist. Desert, very warm and uh, very dry. Savannah is seasonal, usually warm, but seasonal. Temperate forest, also seasonal. That's us. We have cold winters and hot summers. Taiga, cold and moist. Tundra, cold and dry. So those are the biomes. You also have to describe why biomes. Uh, sort of form and why climates form and we looked at a map of Africa Henry said aren't do you notice a pattern and if you notice there's like a line of green which is your tropical rainforest and as you move north of the forest and south of the forest you have banding of similar climates and we said that the reason that it happens is first of all heat hits the earth the equator directly so the sun has more direct rays and then the move the higher you move up in latitude like closer to the poles the light is very diffused, and so the angle of the sun, they don't get direct sunlight, so the, it's not as warm up there. We said, sorry for the junky picture, but we said that the reason that the equator is warm and moist is because there's lots of water in the equator, and that warm water uh, evaporates and condenses, so that warm air is rising, it's very moist, and it condenses and it rains a lot at zero. Now, once it, the air moves, because it circulates, in sort of these like little patterns, that warm moist air that lost its moisture becomes cool air. And that cool air goes, drives and moves all the way to 30, okay? And at 30, it sinks and it's dry. And when it sinks, it's dry air sinking and it gets heated up by the earth and it becomes very dry. So at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, you have your deserts. And the same thing happens at 60. At 60, you sort of have a little bit more air uh, uh, rising up, and so it rains at 60. So zero moist, 30 dry, 60 moist. 
We then learned how to make a climatograph. Just know that the bars are how much rain or precipitation occurs, and the line is how much, uh, what the temperatures are. Okay, so you'll get one of these on your test and you'll have to fill it in. Cool? We then talked about their aquatic biomes. We can't forget there's water on Earth. And so we said that there's freshwater biomes and marine biomes. So for our freshwater list, we had things like swamps, um, wetlands, estuaries, which is where there is something called brackish water, which is a mix of salt and, and freshwater, and rivers and streams and ponds and lakes, all that good stuff. And then marine, uh, you, we had our deep sea ocean called the abyssal, abyssal zone. We had a pelagic zone, which is where this whale is. It's just the open ocean. Um, and intertidal zone, which is your beaches where you have clams and crabs and stuff like that. We also talked about the progression over time of an ecosystem. So um, that's called succession. And so we said if there's a volcano explosion and there's nothing around, you usually have what's called pioneer species. The first one usually arrive are called lichens, and lichens are like this fungus, algae-like critter uh, that sticks to rocks, and they sort of, you know, dissolve the rock a bit to give it cracks and little grooves, and it, it makes it, um, you, you're able to get plants to sort of start growing. And what the pioneer species do of, of weeds and plants and, and bushes is they actually prepare the soil for larger plants, like um, huge trees. And so the, the importance of pioneer species is they prepare the soil for future generations, for future uh, species. And the future species, which are the, the largest ones, uh, make up what's called the, the climax community, which is like the, uh, a very mature ecosystem. Now the theory is this, if you blow up and explode, uh, or something happens to the climax community, that over time all of this will repeat, and succession brings you back to a climax community. We talked a little bit about the job of being an ecologist, and we said, uh, what are some things they're doing out there? And you guys participated and had great answers, things like, you know, they're measuring uh, the size of organisms to see how they're growing, they're taking temperature readings, um, they're measuring how much ice is melting because of global warming. Uh, so check your notes to see what answers you have for that. But know some tools they use and some jobs they do. We then talked about populations. Populations are all the same species. Uh, all in a group. Now they have to be in a given area, okay? So you can't just say lions are a population. You could probably say the Kenyan lions are a population. So populations, like we said, are, are all the polar bears in an area or all the little frogs in an area. So we said there are three characteristics of population, density, dispersion, and range. Density is how packed they are, how many organisms are in a given area. So you, they could have low density or high density. Like the cheetah would be low density. There's only a few cheetahs in many square miles. Or bats in a cave are like crazy packed. Dispersion is how, how the organisms are arranged in an environment. So you got your clumped, which is usually schools of fish or herds where they really clump together. Random is just random. And uniform are evenly spaced populations. We said, what's one advantage of being clumped? And we said in herds, it's great because you're protected against predators, especially if you're that zebra in the middle right there. Um, so that is good, being clumped. We also sort of talked about if you're an ecologist and you had to predict population in an area, which was the best to figure out how many individuals live there. And we said uniform is because you could take a nice random sample and figure out how many um, organisms live in there. If you did clumped, then you might actually sample the wrong clump, and it won't give you good uh, results. What causes random distribution? We said plants are usually random distribution because they, the seeds are wind dispersed uh, or uh, somehow randomly dispersed with animals or anything like that. So uh, the plants land anywhere. But just know that plants can also be uniform. For example, if you have very large trees, uh, trees like to be uniform because um, if any seed falls in between two large trees, it may not survive because there's a lot of shade, there's not many nutrients because the huge trees are sucking all the nutrients uh, and then not a lot of water. So just know, trick, trick, that uh, plants, large trees, can also be uniform. You'll have to be able to explain why they're uniform. We then said range. 
organisms have a particular range, this is where the organism is found. So if you notice, the house sparrow has a larger range than the condor, which has a small range. Now there's some reasons for this. One of them could be that the organism's better adapted to a variety of conditions. So like the dude at the top, the house sparrow, can live in many conditions. Can live in the warmth, can live in the cold, can live when there's not a lot of water, and tons of water. The condor has specific, specific uh, requirements, and so it is only in one little habitat, one range, okay? So that's one, one reason. The other reason could be human impact. So like people can reduce the range of an organism by destroying habitat or just hunting them down so they're only found in a specific uh, protected area maybe. Oh, I just answered that. <laughs> Uh, we also talked about an environment, there's something called biotic factors and abiotic factors. Um, how many predators are in an area, producers, food sources, anything that's alive is biotic. Anything that's not alive, like temperature, how much it rains, how many minerals in the soil, are abiotic factors. Okay, so let's say you were, we, you were in charge of deciding how many, uh, in, in bat in estimating how many organisms are in an area. So that's, we started to talk about how to uh, estimate population sizes. We said the first way you can do it is by taking a sample. So we break up an area into a grid. You then would take a random sample. So here's an example of what you might get on your test, okay? You count up a random sample, 11, 9, 4, and 16. Notice the boxes are not near each other because that would be a poor sample. We said that the environment, you want to take samples that are far away from each other because if you take them next to each other, it might be an area that is more benef like beneficial for the organism, like maybe there's a water source there or something. So we took a random sample of the whole area. To figure out how many are sort of in the entire, all the grids together, what you do is you take your four numbers and add them, and you get 40. And then you figure out an average. So out of those four boxes, there were four boxes, 40 divided by 4 gives you there's 10, the average is, there's 10 per box. And then you just multiply by how many boxes you have. So we actually have 36 boxes in this grid. And so your estimate is, hey, if there's about 10 in each box, then we have about 360 individuals that live here. Okay, so that's how you do those problems. The other type of problem you need to do is tag and recapture. So some organisms are tagged released back into the environment, and then you do a second re-tag. This was the corn lab that we did, but just so you're ready, I changed the numbers around from our rabbit thing. So if you wanna pause the video and try this one, 135 rabbits are captured and marked, two weeks later, 250 rabbits are captured and checked, 28 are marked in the second catch, what's the total population? Well, what you do here is you take the number marked in the first catch. So what we did was we had 135 that we marked. Yay! Then what we did is we grab the second catch so we, that we release this 135 back into the environment, right? We let them go. Then a few weeks later, we come back and we caught 250 of them. Now we look in that 250 and we saw that there were 28 that were marked. Now you better know how to use a calculator because you have to do, you have to uh, type in the first, I've seen people use a calculator, the top numbers first divided by the second numbers. So you end up getting 12, uh, 105. We're going to round up to the nearest individual, by the way. Awesome. So now you know your math. The next thing we talked about is how populations grow. Populations grow. Um, the first thing we said is, hey, what keeps a population stable? So salmon, which are fish that give birth to thousands of, um, of eggs, and elephants, which usually give birth to one calf, we said, how many need to survive in the population? And the answer was two because those two offspring would replace the two parents that die. If two are, uh, survive, then the population stays the same. If more than two survive, the population grows. Everything that limits a uh, population is called a limiting factor. The limiting factors can be density dependent. That means anything that has to do with the density of the population. So that could be there's not enough food. There aren't... Um, enough resources, there's not enough water because there's too many of them competing. Density independent is anything that's a random act of nature or something like uh, some sort of uh, natural disaster or forest fire or anything like that that reduces their population. 
Two types of growth. We said that there's exponential growth, which is growth, um, gross, <laughs> growth that continues unchecked. And the reason it, it grows so fast is because the population that's larger is making more babies. In the beginning, it's really slow growth because there's not a lot of them making organisms, making, uh, doing reproduction. Most populations will eventually reach logistic growth, and this is where there's a carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that can live in an area, and so organisms will grow until the limiting factors make them reach carrying capacity and keep them at a stable, um, a stable population size. Now, we talked about how humans were sort of special because we change our carrying capacity, uh, and we can raise it by ripping down forests, making more food. We then uh, compared R strategists with K strategists, also called R selected organisms and K selected organisms. And we said that R selected are ones that usually make tons of babies that uh, knowing like a lot of them will die. And then our K strategists usually have parental care and usually have one or two organisms, okay? Uh, fish and um, amphibians are usually our strategists. Your safe bet and insects, by the way, are our strategists. And mammals, birds are your um, your K strategists. Try to stay away from reptiles because they exhibit uh, both R and K strategies. And then we made a chart that you can go over in your notes. Just know that each one explains uh, a characteristic of R strategists and K strategists. Okay, so study this chart. We then said uh, you can figure out something called R, and R is the growth rate of population. We sort of compared it to like when you go to a restaurant and you have a tip rate, that if you get a bill, you know how much you have to leave for tip. So here, if we know how much a population grows, we can apply it to the total bill. Here's what I mean. R equals birth rate minus death rate. Now birth rate is the total births divided by the total population. And death rate is the total deaths divided by the total population. So if we have 2,000 mice in a field, 1,000 born each month, this is the problem we did in our notebook. So follow along in your notebook. We said that birth rate is 0 0.5 because it's 1,000 born divided by 2,000 total gives you 0 0.5. And 200 die divided by 2,000 gives you 0 0.1. When you subtract them, you get the rate. Now what's cool is you can use the rate to figure out a problem. So we gave you a problem with if we had a, a population of 5,893, how many total mice would you have at the end of the month? So you take that number, you multiply it by the rate, like if you were figuring out your tip, and then you get how many new mice you would have born. But that's not your answer, because we said how many total mice would you have? And so it's how many mice were there, plus how many were there, and then this is your total number of mice at the end of the month. Cool. Compare graphs. We said the first population at the top is growing, has the same growth rate, but started at different population sizes. And the second one has two different growth rates that started at the same population size. We then lastly talked about communities, which was awesome. It's how all, all, all organisms are interacting together. And we said the interactions that occur are predator-prey interactions. They can compete with one another for resources, especially if they're fighting for the same niche, and also symbiosis. What to know about predator-prey is that the two populations are dependent on one another. So if the prey uh, increases, that means there's more lynxes than the um, Sorry, if the prey increases, which means there's more hares, more rabbits, then you'll get more lynxes. And if the food source goes down, the prey, the predator will decrease as well. And lastly, we talked about symbiosis, how organisms interact with one another. Symbiosis is very close relationships with two species that are different. So mutualism, both organisms benefit, sort of like bee and flower both benefit, or a cleaner shrimp and the fish getting cleaned. Parasitism is where there's one organism harming another, and commensalism is where one benefits and the other is unaffected, sort of like whale barnacle or fish uh, like shark remora kind of thing. Okay, so I hope that helped. If you guys need any more help, just let me know and come see me, and good luck.